The German... <laughs> yeah. 639. Good morning, everybody. The German bank Deutsche Bank is uh, getting rid of a fifth of its workforce. Thousands of jobs could possibly go in the UK. Sean, um, you've got more details. Yeah, big, big news in the city in the world of banking this morning. Morning, everybody. Deutsche Bank, one of the biggest employers in the city of London. It's got almost 8,000 staff in the capital. Not just there, though. There's another 1,500 or so in Birmingham as well, in back office functions there. So today, workers should be getting more details of which jobs around the world, so including the UK, will be going. There are 18,000 18, jobs set to go over the next three years. We've got Shanti Kellerman with us, who looks after investments as portfolio manager at the bank Coot. She joins me from our London newsroom now. Morning to you, Shanti. Good morning. Um, what is it then about the world of investments, the world of banking at the minute, that means Deutsche Bank are having to get rid of so many jobs? So they've tried to pursue a strategy of being a universal bank and having you know, retail banking, having investment banking, doing trading. And what they've realized is some of those areas just aren't profitable. So equity trading is something that's gotten way more efficient due to technology. A lot of shares just trade over an exchange without a human being involved. And that means the revenue pool has shrunk a lot. And it's just too expensive and there's too much competition for someone like Deutsche Bank to be in that area and have offices around the world and have the people on the scale. So, so they've made the decision to come out. They're also creating a bad bank. I think it's a bit late relative to some other banks. You, you know, you saw other U.S. banks doing this back in 2010 and 2011. Deutsche Bank has tried for a long time to just cut costs, but mm. they haven't seen their revenues go up, so they've had to make this difficult decision. So if you work in financial services anywhere across the UK and you're saying, you know, the, the world of making money out of shares and the way banks traditionally made money in a lot of ways isn't the same anymore, what does it mean for you if you, if you work in financial services right now? What's changing? So I think that there are two main things. One is technology. So there are a lot of functions like, say, making two trades match or settling things or clearing a transaction. A lot of that's done automatically, which in some ways is a good thing because it's more efficient and you also have less risk. But that means there's less you know, manual labor for people to do. And then the other big part of it is, is regulations. It means that there's more stringent rules. It, creates higher costs, it also makes everyone safer. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think those two factors make it a difficult environment for a lot of financial services companies and it, it makes it something where people have to think carefully about which businesses they want to be in and where they can actually make money and where they're better off exiting and leaving it to someone else. Another thing affecting the world of investments at the minute and for, for those that work in them is just how the economy is doing. The headlines in the papers today, seeing the word confidence a lot, uh, seems mm. that confidence isn't as high as a lot of people would like it to be. How do you see how the, the British economy is doing right now? I think we're, we're kind of petering along. So, you know, our, our growth is expected to be between 1% and 2% which isn't fantastic, but it's better to have growth than no growth. I think some of that is due to just the global economy slowing, and the UK is very linked to the global economy because of all the, the trading we do and all the things we send all over the world. And I think there is also a part of it where people are worried about not just Brexit, but about what the change in the US or China will be. And so they're a bit reluctant to invest in new things and make decisions and make investments. So. And just finally, in, in an hour's time, I'm going to be talking about uh, no deal Brexit and if that happened, what the consequences might be, are we prepared for it? What do you think would happen to our economy if we left with no deal be by October the 31st? I think there would almost certainly be a, a little bit of a shock. It, I think the more important question is how quickly could we adapt to it? Um, because there will be issues with, you know, how do the rules work? What do I follow? Am I allowed to do this? And that might result in people just sort of freezing and not doing anything for a while. But what will matter is, do we have guidance? Do we have help from the government to rebound, to start trading with other companies, to figure out what regulations we're going to follow? Um, and that will determine, I think, the, you know, the next few years for Britain. Shanti, uh, thanks for joining, uh, joining us this morning. Shanti Kellerman there from the bank Coots. So I'll be talking lots more. Be interested people. Let us know their plans for no deal Brexit because in an hour, are we ready for it? Can the economy handle it? Uh, and what would the consequences be? Because Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, the two in battling to be our next prime minister, they say no deal is very much on the table. Sean, uh, thank you very much. And worrying times. For
7.43. Now, both candidates vying to become Prime Minister say they won't rule out a no-deal Brexit. How ready are we? That's the focus of a big BBC investigation. Sean's here to tell us more. Yeah, morning. Uh, this is the BBC Panorama team mm. looking at what would happen if there was no deal and are we prepared? Uh, because it's on the table, that's so that Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt say, the prospect of leaving the European Union without a deal. So that's all those trading relationships we have with the European Union and other countries around the world, they effectively would get torn up and we'd have to start all over again. So what goes on at borders, the amount of taxes you pay, all of that um, could be a bra brave new world come mm. November. So they've been looking at this and they've spoken on Panorama to the man who was in charge of Brexit planning for the government up until mm. March. Uh, Panorama's Jane Corbyn was speaking to him and he said that everybody should be worried by the prospect of a no deal. No deal um, is a step into the unknown and it is a venture that is fraught with risk. There's no doubt about that. Is Britain ready for no deal? The planning, I think, is in good shape, absolutely. But, of course, what that doesn't mean is that there won't be an impact from Brexit, uh, and particularly a no-deal Brexit, because that is a very major change. And Jane asked the pertinent question there. Are, are we ready for no deal? Well, it, it sort of depends who you speak to. We had Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, saying 150,000 businesses still haven't got the paperwork in place to actually continue exporting to the European Union if we left without a deal. But then loads of businesses that I speak to say, particularly smaller businesses, will say, well, we haven't got the money to put in the contingency plans for every possible scenario, so we're going to be more reactive than, than proactive, perhaps. Mm. Uh, bigger businesses have a bit more money to stockpile, to open up offices abroad. Uh, Panorama spoke to lots of different businesses, from farmers to pharmaceuticals. Had to just wait for a sec because we couldn't afford to, to produce the milk and look after our livestock. It would break my heart to see no cows here come out in the morning and empty shed. I think a no deal scenario would be quite catastrophic to the agricultural industry, especially the dairy industry. Our main products are in epilepsy and also we have some life-saving cancer medicines here. We've spent over £10 million on our preparations, various aspects of it, and that's in hard cash. If we hadn't done the preparations and we didn't have the stockpiling, clearly medicines might not be available. So, yeah, you can see businesses spending a lot of money. That's at half past eight tonight on BBC One to catch the whole investigation there. Um, also, breaking news in the, book, the last uh, 15 minutes or so mm. about British Airways being fined £183 million over a customer data hack. I mean, that is a large fine. What's it all about? It is a large fine. It's about this hack last year that we heard that British Airways customers, there were 185,000 customers in the end that had their payment details stolen, effectively, one way or another. Um, but £183 million, pounds, I mean, I know it's a big figure, that is by a long way the biggest fine imposed by the Information Commissioner's Office. The previous one was half a million pounds to Facebook. But those new rules have come in, those new data rules have come in, and they have imposed them with some force. So I'll have more on that after Yeah, it's 1.5% of their annual turnover, mm -hmm. isn't it? And um, more on that later. July. Uh, let's start with the story that's broken in the last hour or so. British Airways is to be fined a record £183 million after a massive data breach last year. That news has broken in the past hour or so. It relates to the theft of personal and financial information from the airline's website and mobile app last year. Sean's got the details. And Sean, just, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a big fine, um, but it comes down to how much profit they've made, does it? Well, uh, not, not necessarily to do with the money they're making, but what it really comes down to is the mm. new powers that the regulator have. Do you remember we spent all that time last year talking about GDPR, the new data protection rules coming mm. in and a lot of that was about you know the kinds of emails we get through and are we being spammed and who holds our data but it was also a big part of that was about giving the regulator more powers to put pressure on companies to deal with companies when they make big mistakes and that's what British Airways did last year so in September last year we heard from British Airways that their website had been hacked people people's payments details had been exposed uh, sometimes to you know quite a uh, a worrying degree uh, and then a month later British Airways came back and said actually it was it was worse than we thought so overall uh, half a million customers have been affected and, and that's what we're hearing from the regulator this morning 183 million pounds because of that um, and what have British Airways said about it that they're surprised and disappointed they say by it so they've got time to appeal now the way this system works and we'll probably over the months and years hear a lot more about this of this kind of thing they've now got 28 days to appeal they feel it's harsh what one reason that they might feel it's harsh, 
is because when we've heard of fines around data previously from this regulator, the biggest one before was Facebook for half a million pounds. £183 million is a huge figure. Mm. It's a big figure for British Airways because it's 1.5% of the entire amount of money they bring in all around the world by selling tickets on flights. That's not profits, just the amount of money they bring in. Right. So it will eat into their profits um, and will be a real new thing for businesses to have to consider if there's a risk now of fines of this size. Mm. That, of course, the British Airways owners make billions of pounds a year. Mm. So it's not going to put the company on the brink. But it changes things massively and tells businesses you can't afford to put people's data at risk. Sean, a very...